Hey guys, welcome to Chess on the Brain. So I'm going to analyze round two of the FIDE candidates match. That was yesterday, or yeah, officially yesterday, now on the 18th of March. And let's pull up the results so far. So Caruana and MVL, I guess it's um, Bachier Le Grave, um, something like that, French name. Um, so Caruana versus MVL. They defeated um, Alexenko and Loren today. So we had two wins, and then Nepomniachi got a draw against Grishuk, and Wong got a draw against Geary. So two really exciting games and two wins. Um, so let's take a look at how they won. And just that's basically what I want to get to is just understanding the ideas behind it. I'm not just going to give you some, you know, computer-generated lines. I really want to. That's what the channel is all about: is getting to the ideas behind it. And as you can see, I added. Pawns the soul of chess, Philidor's quote. I added that back to the bottom, one of my favorite chess quotes. So everything is gonna come back to the pawns and you're gonna see how the players that win really use their pawns effectively. And then of course, use their pieces in coordination with their pawns to win. So let's get to that, creating weaknesses and, and creating really strong attacks. And so the first one, let's go to the list of the games. So yeah, the first one should be the Caruana versus Alexenko game. Okay, so Caruana plays d4, Alexenko goes knight f6. <clears throat> c4, e6. So we have our standard, these are the Indian defense is starting with knight f6. And e6 opens the gate for the bishop to do the Nimzo Indian after knight c3. So Nimzo Indian, hitting the knight. And really one of the main ideas behind the Nimzo Indian is restraint. So you're gonna restrain that knight from controlling the e4 square because white of course wants to play e4. Well, Caruana goes for the very aggressive f3. Okay, so he plays f3 in order to just say, hey, I, I wanna control e4 and play, play it right away. And also you just stop your opponent. Alexenko can't just go knight e4 right away and put more pressure here. A lot of times in the Nimzo Indian, black likes to go c5, striking the d4 pawn, and just hitting those light, hitting the dark squares rather, and the queen can quickly come to a5 in coordination with the bishop, and they're really just gonna strike at that knight, gonna feel the heat with that pin. All the pieces coming in against that knight on c3. So that's one of the key ideas behind the Nimzo, is just that restraint, the pressure on the knight, and often we're gonna create the imbalance of bishop versus knight by taking on c3 and also doubling the pawns. He doesn't do it in this game though. So he plays after f3, d5. I think that's the main move, either d5 or again, c5 is common too, but black has to strike back. Black has to strike back somehow against white center. White goes a3. So I don't know the, the theory on this, but bishop back to e7. A lot of times they will take the knight on c3, but uh, Alexenko wanted to preserve the bishop and didn't work out too well for him. Uh, let's let's actually quickly open that up. We can we can do um, we can do book, and it says that yeah, bishop takes c3 is by far the most common move. So maybe bishop e7 was to throw him off a bit. Um, it does say, it does actually score a little bit better for black than bishop takes c3. You see 29% versus 21% in ma among the master games that, that leechess.org has on there. So bishop back to e7. I mean, clearly taking on c3 is just the kind of intuitive move. You're not wasting any time. Let's say he takes on c3, he takes c3, and again, we're, we're going to strike in the center. So he's going to stick both pawns in the middle, d5 and c5. And who cares, okay, you don't have the bishop pair, but you're just going for rapid development. White's got a lot of weaknesses in this position too. Weak pawns, this is a isolated double. Okay, you can undouble it, but one of them is gonna be weak on the C file, will generate pressure there. Pressure against the D pawn, the E3 square doesn't have any pawns defending it. So there's just a lot of weaknesses in here. There's nothing, no pawn defending that. So black would hope to just get rapid development and infiltrate white's position in that sort of thing. So that's just kind of, just to show you an alternative. No, you don't You don't have to retreat your bishop to e7. You could just go ahead and chop the knight on c3 and continue rapid deployment of your pieces. Now, bishop goes back to e7, and then we get pawn to e4. 
pawn to e4. So white is just just striking. I mean, that's Karwana's idea. Now, I'm trying to think of who it was. I, I think it was between So and Aronian. Some of you might recall that game. I think I think Aronian won that game. I recall, if I recall, So was playing. And So was, by the way, Wesley So has been doing amazing. That I really hope that that he would w qualify for the candidates and uh, and win because he just he crushed Magnus Carlsen in that chess 960, which I love. And um, I love the game. And it's just it was interesting to see. Carlson fall like that. I don't know. He, he just so just came out of nowhere. So um, unfortunately, he's not he's not playing this year. But he so so played. I think it was f3 line, and then Aronian did not f6 and got his d5 and c5, and uh, even did a piece sacrifice, crushed him in that game. So that's just another way this can go. Oh no, I keep saying so. So bishop e7, e4, d takes e4, f takes e4. Okay. Now remember, we have to, to really understand the idea behind the Nimzo Indian. You gotta strike back on the dark squares. That's that's just gonna happen uh, as soon as possible. So especially since Alexenko has, has, you know, hasn't really done anything, retreated his bishop back to e7. He's got to assert himself in the center. If he doesn't, he's gonna get steamrolled. E5 is gonna come next. It's gonna steamroll him. So he has to strike back on the dark squares and i think now for example this, you can't steamroll him now if you do this actually can that just seems too it just seems like you're kind of breaking up your structure because you can't get away with this move takes he just takes here and then white is picking up two pieces so you can't get away with that for black but what he would probably do oh this is there's actually been a game like this versus peter Laco. He did not. So we see what happens if white tries e5. I mean, hey, it was Nadjura 2635 does um, e5. Leiko goes knight fd7. And how does it continue? He Well, he takes on c5. And and there you go. Okay, it's kind of like in a French where you get that, you, you strike with c5 and you get to collapse their center. And um, I mean, hey, may, maybe, uh, I don't know about winning chances for black at this point, but black is... Definitely comfortable. Lego had to be comfortable. Okay, they got a queen trade. Yeah, white's got a queen side majority. Um, but if you get one of these pawns back, then black is just up a pawn. We got four, five, six versus six at the moment. You might win one of these back later on. Free pawn, I'll take it. I'll take the four versus two majority on a king side. So just to just to kind of give you an idea, a little bit of opening uh, kind of kind of on the on the fly opening theory, right? That's with with this technology where you can quickly just open up, you know, you get the opening book and you can do that or you can do uh, 365chess.com and you can actually see the frequency at which certain players um, do different openings. So for for example, let's say Karyakin, we say Karyakin game, or let's say Leiko had played this like 50 times or 30 times, you would see, okay, under 365chess.com, Leiko has played this a certain number of times, you see order of frequency. So you're gonna choose the, the expert in that line, it's sort of like their pet variation. And that's the best to learn from, right? Somebody who really knows what they're doing. Um, so D5. Now, okay, so I guess you can say it's, it's an imbalance. I mean, it's a concession to some extent for Caruana because he, he is weakening the, the dark squares, like for example, the E5 square, which I think his, his opponent will be able to infiltrate. But I mean, you gotta say there's a, there's a protected past pawn, right? The pawns made it past it, it can just continue to push. And we're gonna see that's gonna have a big impact. So this is, this is not really an issue. You know, there's some structural weakness by, by the, here. This pawn is also weak. A little bit of structural weakness is compensated for by dynamic strength, which is often the case. You can take on really crappy looking pawns, just, just you know, trash pawns. But if you get active pieces, who cares, right? Because the pieces can crash through and you win the game. Okay, so we have E takes D5. And this is all theory. It looks like this has all been played quite a few times. Now, I was, you know, I was thinking about this. Which, which pawn would he take back? Should he take back with the E pawn or the C pawn? Now, he chose the E pawn, which... You know, both of these here um, score pretty high. Oh, actually, you may not be able to even see this. Sorry, um, probably not. Yeah, yeah, because I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, that, that would be blocked right there. Um, but th this is behind, uh, behind all this. Sorry about that. But just, I'm basically just. Oh, I, if you're on leechess.org, there's an opening book, and if you open that up, then it'll just, it'll just pop up immediately, kind of overlay um, on top of the moves of the game on the on the notation and it'll just tell you the percentages uh, 
the percentages that white wins, black wins, and draws. So we have 25% wins for black and only 17% for white. So maybe, um, I guess, uh, you know, Alexenko was looking at this and he's like, hey, I have the theories, you know, at least based on how it's performed, this has actually done pretty well for black in practice. And if he takes with the C pawn, 67% wins for, okay, out of three games, but two thirds wins for black if you go this way. I'm thinking that's because you have some problems on this E4 pawn, see? I mean, you don't have the F pawn anymore, so there's nothing to guard, there's no pawn to guard the E4 pawn. And you might see some pressure against that. And, and as I said, you can also blockade this pawn as well. So C takes D5. Yeah, it's just a little, a little much. It's, not, it's a little too ambitious, asking for too much. So he takes back with the E pawn, a little more modest. And um, yeah, Caruana is just, just comfortable. You know, he, he didn't, Alex Senko didn't really challenge him. He didn't double his pawns. You know, he didn't take on C3. He kind of wasted some time coming here and going back. Caruana has got a protected past pawn, meaning again, it's beyond the other pawns and it's protected by another pawn, which is an asset. Now it needs to be blockaded, but he doesn't achieve that. I quickly, just quickly looked at it first, but I want to kind of just kind of go through it. As I'm going through it, I want to think it through. Um, and if anyone's watching, feel free to share your thoughts as well. So castles, bishop e2, rook e8. Okay. So you, you can see he's x-raying the king. So basically, Caruana needs to get his pieces out, and he does. He gets knight f3 and castles on the very next move. Okay, bishop g4. And again, I mean, uh, bishop g4, the theory is sure. In practice, we have, well, okay, it's played by 2200s. Well, 2500 beat a 2288, and a 2488, I'm sorry, Drew, and a 2488 beat a 2373. So it's like... It's kind of disparity, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. There's a certain percentage of wins, but the wins are all going toward, the, you know, to the higher rated players. It's like, well, is it because they're stronger or because of the opening? It's hard to know. You have to delve into it a bit more. Um, but, I mean, on the surface, you do some research, say, hey, this looks pretty good for black. Well, Caruana proved otherwise in this game. So, Bishop G4. Anyway, forget about the theory now. Let's just look at the rest of the game. So, Bishop G4, Castle. I don't know. I mean, I I think I still think Caruana is comfortable. You know, he's just he just got this. Uh, he's got the F file now. Do you half open F file these for his rook? He's got the space advantage. Bishops are coming out. Okay. You can say Alex nagel has got activity on the E file. A little pressure here. So he's got moving out there. There. So he's got some counter pressure. Yeah. But I still think it's more comfortable for Caruana. Knight BD7. But he's got to prove it. So the second he goes Knight BD7, um, Caruana really. He takes a risk. He goes with d6. I'd say a calculated risk, though. I mean, now whether or not this was part of his home preparation, that, that would be interesting to find out. But um, I mean, look, you past pawns must be pushed. Again, going back to pawns, the soul of chess. We got a protected past pawn. We get to push it to d6 with the tempo and the bishop on e7. So it goes back to f8. And well, you'll see this knight is coming into b5 in two moves. So knight gets into b5, threatening to go to c7, while it just happens to guard d6. And in his calculate, in his you know, when he's calculating, he says, "Hey, look, I can, I can go. To, I'm just you know, and he's trying to guess. I can only assume what how deep Caruana's calculations are. But I mean, obviously, he he can see that bishop f4 easily guards d6. And who knows? In some lines, you might even sack it if you get some something. But I don't. I don't Honestly, I don't think he has to sacrifice it. It's just a wedge, you know, it's a wedge pawn. It's a, it's a splinter in your opponent's position, like a thorn. You get to push that pawn deep into your opponent's territory on the sixth rank, very uncomfortable. And uh, the knight, yeah, the knight following up, the bishop following up, maybe pinning it, maybe maybe pinning the knight, maybe going to f4 to secure it. The queen coming up, the rook coming from behind. You could just see there's, there's a really beautiful centralization of Caruana's pieces. Everything has its place. So watch out for the bishop on e2 when the knight moves because there's pressure on that. That's about it. And, you know, your king's a little open, but can he exploit it? No, because Caruana's pieces are so much more active than Alexanko's. So that's that's something that's important, some important features of this position. Um, so h3, okay. Putting the question to the bishop, bishop h5. So this is, this is in the air. g4 is in the air. I mean, obviously it's going to be a weakness if you do it, but it's, it's something you have to consider. Okay, knight goes to b5. So again, he's guarding d6, but he's just he's just threatening a fork of the two rooks. So it's a direct threat. 
Well, the rook goes to e6. So basically he's saying, all right, well, if you want to go to c6, you can you can fork me on c7, but that would be an amateur's move. Why? Because the rook will take on d6, hitting the queen, guarded by the bishop, and then that falls on the next move, if you can envision it. Envision the knight going to c7, the rook taking d6, guarded by the bishop, right? And the queen has to, there's no way to guard the knight. The knight just falls. So, okay, best you can get. Now, you'd have to give up your queen and your knight for two rooks. That's that's terrible, right? That's nine. That's 12 points for 10 points. So, down two points, you know, it's a lost position. So, obviously, he's not going to do that. But like I said, um, that's why he has bishop f4 at his disposal, securing the pawn, further controlling the c7 square, being able to anchor in the knight, which is coming next. So every again, there's a logic to everything he does. Everything is, is just like really well coordinated, in harmony. So that's what you want. You always want a harmonious setup, pieces working together, one unit. A6, knight c7. Well, he gets his fork. What's going on? Um, I mean, it's just an uncomfortable situation here, you know. Rookie six. Yeah, I mean. Knight, there's, there's no way to stop the intrusion of the knight, but okay, you, you have to ask, like, what if he just, what if he just moved the rook? I mean, if he goes to e8, he still gets forked. The only other square to go to is e4. I'm sure there's some refutation. Let's see. Hmm. What do you think? What would he do? That's 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 tricky. I mean, he does he does gain a tempo by hitting the bishop. So obviously, Caruana had some preparation for this. He he was anticipating this. But what is it? I'm having trouble seeing what what he was thinking. Uh, let's try and figure this out. As I said, you know, I'm kind of just I, I want you to you know I I, I want to show like how I'm thinking through it. This is not some refined you know pre-processed thing um, where I where I plugged it into a computer and stuff. I haven't looked at it on the computer. I just, I'm, I'm just showing you how I, you know, it's just as, an, you know, not as a top level grandmaster, just as a, I say, just as a black belt, right? And I don't have my stripes as national master, a candidate master, internet, you know, 2200, I hit like 22 something feet a. So yeah, I know how to play chess, but I'm not at that level, right? But so I think I'm somewhere in between where I'm able to like, maybe hopefully understand their ideas, sometimes with little assistance as well as to, but you know, cause I'm really big on the ideas when I teach my students, it's all about planning like Silman technique, um, Silman thinking of, of really, you know, finding a dream position, breaking down the imbalances, having a clear plan. So that's what I hope to to sort of to find that blend. Let's try and figure out how these guys are thinking at the top level to some extent. More importantly, what can we take from it in terms of our planning, right? So, but yeah, this is just a, a bit a, a bit more cryptic. So rookie four hitting the bishop. There must be some explanation. We might have to. I, I don't want to try to open the engine, but the, the computer. But if we need to, we will. Let's try to figure it out. So he, he actually goes for a6, which just allows us, then he goes, then he goes rookie four. So that if that gives us any indication, and then the bishop goes to h2. Oh, okay. Well, you might, you might see a sort of transposition. Then. Like what, what if, what if he does actually um, simply retreat to, to h2? I mean, this, this is still coming if he wants. Ah, so is this. Where's the rook going to go? That's one of the ideas. It's not. It's not just like a one mover. Caruana, I, I, whether he found it over the board, or ha, or again whether this was uh, home cooked, or computer cooked with his twelve thousand dollar laptop, um, knight c, which has got to allow it to play like okay, close to alpha zero strength. Um, so it's not just the fork. The fork was the the tempo gainer, right? This was the tempo gainer. The fact that he can be able to threaten to win. The exchange, which in this case, wide open board, the two open files in the middle, that's going to be a huge win for for Caruana, right? Against the Russian. Interesting backdrop too, as as both countries uh, have some sort of you know are, are dealing with uh, like like for example Russia, which where Putin is trying to consolidate his power and essentially become a you know moving closer to full dictatorship by uh, you know what was it to to gain power until 2036 and it started like early 2000s. So it's insane. And then we have. All the, and the backdrop of the coronavirus too. So it's just interesting psychologically, you know, you have, all, and of course you have in the US with Trump and also like dictatorial tendencies. So we have this shift towards dictatorship, you have the coronavirus 
It's just, it, and I don't know, it, obviously the top players like this, they have to be able to keep a keep a clear head, right? But, but you wonder whether it, whether it gets to them at all. So bishop to f4, a6. Yeah, but I think that pretty much explains it. I imagine we have with rook e4, I imagine we have rook, bishop h2. Okay, let's quickly just verify that. Yeah, it's, it's saying well, first it says bishop h2. It fluctuated, but yeah, it's 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 going with bishop. And then it said bishop. It looked at bishop g3. It looked at queen d2. But yeah, it's going with bishop h2. It's saying like plus 0.3. It's it's basically saying white's better, but maybe maybe he should have gone with this. Um, yeah, it's saying it's the best move. Okay, forget about this. Oh, now it's saying 98. And then it's saying G5. Okay, it doesn't. It has no idea what to do, and that's why I'm not using the computer. Because <laughs> I mean, we could quickly, we could quickly look at it and you know get an idea. But again, that's. I think it's far more valuable to to, to pull the, the the essential ideas or try to, rather than um, oh, and the computer says this line and this line and this line and blah 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 and who cares, right? Uh, um, I want to know the ideas. That's what this channel is all about. I'm not just gonna. It's not just about. It's not just to, to show you the game. And, and just flip through it. It's not it's not just to show you the computer lines, but it's to show you um, if I'm looking at games or Chess 960 in particular, to you know instill the the, the, the key ideas. Okay, so Bishop f4, a6, Knight c7, Rook e4. So so again, like kind of similar lines to what we were looking at. And again, I mean, really the dilemma for, for it's Alexenko, Alexenko, um, our. Oh my bad. Yeah, Alex Cinco, I guess Alex Cinco. So um, the the real dilemma for him is, well, yeah, I mean, what does he do with his pieces, right? And and that's that's really the virtue of this pawn getting into d6, and it just sort of you cause this confusion in, in in his opponent's position. So and and not only does that not, that that, but it allows you to anchor your knight on c7. So. Rook e4, yeah, okay, you, you you hit a bishop, right? Okay, great, I'm attacking the bishop. The bishop doesn't care, it goes back to h2, everything's solid. Caruana maintains his solidity, and he still, you know, gives his opponent problems to, uh, poses problems for him. And that's another great chess quote by Nimzovich. The threat is greater than the execution. So don't know, you know, a lot, a lot of players, they really want to, they want to execute, right? They want, they, they want to do, they want to carry out this awesome line right away and get their victory. Well, okay, if you can, great, but you know, in, in practical chess, it's like just just keep the pressure, keep pressing, keep pressing, and that's actually a lot more uncomfortable for your opponent. And overall, it'll probably lead to a lot more victories. Okay, rook c8, g4, bishop takes, pawn takes, knight takes, bishop d3. All right, so we take on h2, take on e4. Okay, so so he's going for some sacrifice, right? After Rook C, I guess he felt that his position was really deteriorating, and that he wanted to go with the sacrifice. Now, okay, so let's say let's say he declines the sacrifice. I mean, the natural move is, uh, or rather, just doesn't doesn't rather doesn't choose to sacrifice. He goes Bishop G6. Seems like a natural enough move, but again, what's going on with this Rook? How is it gonna How is it gonna get to safety? It's literally it's a beautiful situation. It's like pretty much trapped in the center. Do we have bishop d3 or knight g5? Maybe bishop bishop d3 comes in here. Well, now he's hitting this one. Hmm. It's a little tricky. I think it just it's just running into problems. You know that uh, I'm sure you, there's some complex lines behind it. I think where if he goes to g6. And we go to d3. Uh, we also have maybe knight g5 to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think knight g5. No, then he has rook d4. My bad. So no, it doesn't seem to work. Um, I think he's going to have to go with this. Can we take it? Something like this. Okay. We can still attack the rook again here. Okay, I briefly looked at something like this. There was something like this I briefly saw. Um, 
I think you just no. What, 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 what do you do then? I mean, I, I think there's some pressure you can generate here. Maybe it's is it g5 first? Because if he goes here, then he's really running out of squares, right? Then he's really getting his own rook suffocated. Um, if he goes back. Now do we have, uh, I don't even know if we need bishop f4. I mean, we have like moves like, we have moves like this. I mean, the problem is he keeps on running into issues on his f7 pawn. So it really is becoming a target for our Tinko. So g5, knight e4, yeah, that doesn't work, yeah. So I think he's gonna have to go to e8 and then queen d5 just looks very, <clears throat> very powerful. Centralizing your pieces. Bishop's coming back to here. So we don't, the thing is, if we do it right away, we get this stuff. And again, anything, he always has this, this square. Yeah, he's kind of, he's getting out that way, I think. We don't want to, we don't want to do that. We don't want to let him go to here. So we want to keep the rook as uncomfortable as possible. So I think we're going with queen d5. Let's do, let's do a quick, um, no, maybe not. My bad. Look at, we'll use the engine for this one. So it's because it's just super tactical. So it's saying the engine can be your friend. <laughs> you just have to, you know, know when to use it. So, okay, it turns out on uh, bishop d3 is worth looking. It does work. Okay, so he goes rook e3, right? We did, okay, briefly looked at this. This is correct. Oh, and then we just go queen d2. And he's got problems again. I mean, you see, the problem is look at this queen. Look at the rook. Look at the bishop. <laughs> Everything is cooped up, right? So this this rook is like it's all alone. And so that's again, that's really the 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 kind of unsettling impact of that pawn on d6. It's such a strong pawn. Pawn's the soul of chess, right? That one pawn it just creates this really just just really makes your opponent uncomfortable, and it's just not clear how he's gonna how he's gonna do anything about his rook. The rook is too loose. So it, it's suggesting, oh yeah, we got rook e4. Queen d3, rook a d1. I mean, there's a myriad of choices here. Well, it even recommended, see, I was looking at this g5 stuff. Does it work right away? g5, knight e8, rook f e1, rook a e1. You sack the pawn. Again, like I said, queen the queen d5 idea. Oh, no, no, this is hanging. So he can't do that. No, he has to do something. He has to give it. Okay, knight takes d6. So the, the knight on c7 is going to drop at the end of this line. But I just, you could see these pieces are just like, just booming through here. Rook takes e1. Oop, not there. Rook takes e1. Rook takes e1. Queen takes c7. And we can do rook e8 check to try to pull the, pull the rook away. Wow, we can create this kind of, this kind of Zugzwang scenario where it was, was basically, it's just going to be tied up here. Go back to e7, get him pinned. Okay, we're winning an exchange. You go g8, 95. We pick up an exchange. It's over. And that's no, that's not even plus two. That's just game. Because I mean, the, this rook is going to clean up. It should be no match. Uh, if you go b6, I think we can just go b3. Yeah, we go b3, and we start plundering all these pawns. So that's that's a win. I mean, rook versus knight endgame um, with many pawns left. So stuff like I mean, it's it's, it's very complex. But Caruana is so good at piercing the fog of war and just seeing through these complexities. Um, you know, that's, you know, the key thing is like just being able to kind of like see through the center as, as, as pieces start clearing off and then, and then trying to envision an end game, which Capablanca was brilliant at just, just like, again, you have all this fog in the, in the middle game just saying, okay, can I just, once that clears, what kind of an end game are we going to achieve? And you, you want to gear toward that. So H takes G six. Okay. So we looked at, um, we looked at bishop f, was it bishop f4 and then, no, no, queen d2, queen d2. So yeah, of course, yeah, bishop f4 just didn't make sense because the, the, the bishop's loose. Why, why let your bishop be loose? We want his rook to be loose, not the bishop. And rook e4. Now we have multiple. I mean, g5 is good. Like we just looked at something like queen d3 is interesting because we're threatening g5. It's saying knight b6. Okay, we want to secure this, I guess. Still have similar threats. Okay, they could take. And 
the queen takes, or the bishop takes. Uh, okay, let's not trade queens. Knight takes. Yeah, so it's all very complex lines, but knight e5. <clears throat> so trying to pull the knight away from the defense of the rook, but we're hanging our bishop. We're trying to win the exchange though, because if they take the bishop, and we, yeah, we, we're going to get the, the knight, and then we're going to get the rook, and we're winning an exchange in this. Oh wait, wait, hold on. What's going on? Um, what am I thinking? The knight's still guarding it. So we take on d6. We're, yeah, we're winning a whole piece. Okay, that was a mess. Let's let's review that. So it's saying it's saying knight d5. The threat isn't now. The, like I said, the immediate threat is knight takes f6. Now what if they? Yeah, they, this is too loose. I mean, this is all loose. So they can't. They can't like if they retreat. Knight e7 check. We just get that fork. But once we get the trade, okay, we're winning an exchange. And if they try to take back, then we just take this one, and now we're up a whole rook, <laughs> it looks like, yeah, and if they try to take our queen, well, we're still winning, uh, we're still up a rook, yeah, so we're winning material in all those lines, the knight, no, knight takes c4 is just looking really loose, um, but yeah, it, it's just, it's just bad, I mean, there's, it's a really tough position here because well you have g5 in the air you have the knight well, not not knight d5 but the knight's on b6 only if it takes on c4 I don't know what's another like normal move or what else can they do something boring like queen d7 um, knight e5 I mean we're gonna get that rook <laughs> we're, we're just gonna get that rook I guess um, where did the queen even go I don't know what, what if she just tries to run away somewhere. Okay, that's just some interesting lines. But again, the G5 idea is going to come through, and we're going to be removing the knight from the defense of the rook. And I don't know, I feel like it's going to have to give up this, and we take back, and then the knight's going to have to retreat, and, and then we just go back and up the exchange, still having pressure on F7, I mean, just with a dominant position. So that's just, yeah, it, it was super complex and really deep calculation that he had to do if I uh, yeah I, honestly that, that, that's the that's the one point where I had to just look on the computer because and, may, and, and one earlier point that was pretty tricky too but um, beyond that that was just pure tactics but it's also again it's also just like a sense for the, the dominant the dominance of the pieces that you're going to achieve um, okay so that's if he goes back it's if he doesn't decline so he says all right I decline the sacrifice um, my opponent's doing really well or rather, I choose not to sacrifice. So, so I, so I go for a sacrifice. I, I go. Um, bishop takes g4. Pawn takes g4. Now he took, he took with the knight. What if he had taken with the rook? It seems like that was probably a better choice. I mean, he gains a tempo. Instead, he takes with the knight, but he's he wants more, right? Because he wants to, of course, get in here and create a little chaos. Uh. White's king is open. I mean, you can you can claim that, but but often the bishops can sort of serve as as substitute pawns, right? If you kind of get the bishops in front of your king somehow. At least we have this guy in h2, king h1. Maybe we can kind of have a shelter there. And in the meantime, again, these these pieces are still tied, you know, still tied up in here. Um, the queen still can't really do much because the knight the knight is keeping the queen at bay, so she can't really activate. And this bishop is just, again, just holding this line. So unless they want to sacrifice an exchange, they just can't really get out of this, this bind they find themselves in. So then he goes bishop d3, which looks very strong. Knight takes on h2, trying to... Well, I mean, he's like, hey, I, I just I just got to get rid of this bishop so I can take on d6 and get some real counterplay. So knight takes, bishop takes, and picks up f1... Hmm, what's going on now? I mean, we're just getting a liquidation now, essentially. We're liquidating, so Alexinko's getting a few pawns for a piece, I guess, because because we have okay, so he was up at this point. He was he was up a piece, right? Caruana won the uh, bishop. He's hitting the rook. Okay, takes a piece, takes a rook, takes a rook, takes a piece. So we got one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so we're just liquidating and just trading down pieces. Um, but he's got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So it's four for six, you know, two pawns for a piece. Usually that's not adequate. And again, like 
It, it, it would be one thing if, if Karawana's king were really exposed and, and there were actually pieces, you know, positioned to exploit that. Okay, the king is kind of open, but you have queen g2. I mean, and again, if you move the knight somewhere, um, once the knight moves somewhere, you can always tuck your bishop back on g2. I mean, the king is not going to be in trouble anytime soon. Uh, yeah, maybe get bishop d6, you know, hitting here. Okay, a little bit of pressure, but again, like, just these pieces have been so deactivated that it's going to take him a while to really generate any pressure against Karawana's king. So Karawana had to foresee, and that's the kind of like, okay, calculation will only get you so far. Just like I'm mentioning about, you know, understanding what, what the computer says is the best line. That'll only get you so far. But this kind of evaluation at the end of the line that Karawana did where he's like, okay, I imagine where he's looking at, he's like, okay, I got the piece for a couple pawns. But more importantly, yeah, I have to realize that this, another imbalance that someone talks about another imbalance that my king is exposed but does it matter here i don't think so he he's able to figure that out i mean even here the computer is only saying plus 0.6 for white so it's like it's not like it's a plus three situation like like it's over it's, it's still a game but it you know he's like well he's going to get this pawn back yes it's going to be three pawns for a piece but it's it's still knight comes back to d5 it's still a piece so it, it should be stronger than the pawns here if they can't, unless the pawns are like swarming his position. Okay, so it's saying he should have just gone knight f6 and struck at the bishop. Okay, so he goes bishop takes d6, which seems pretty reasonable. Karawana, obviously, he fought, well, that knight, I mean, he kind of, he did his work on d on c7, now he comes here. So he, the knights did, had an interesting journey, um, but now he's a really dominant piece. I mean, once he gets his rook in the game somehow... Here, here, I mean, all of Karawana's pieces are going to be excellent. And there's just, again, there's really just nothing to do against Karawana here. It's so solid. So g6, queen h3. And now, and now he's actually, hey, he, he might even start some counterattacks himself. And again, you just, there's no, there's no way to check him, no way to do anything. So king, king goes up. Really nice. King h1 and nothing. Absolutely nothing to do. Okay, 95. And he declines. He declines the trade uncompromising move knight h4 and he's going to go here create an x-ray go for knight f5 we can see that's coming so he's just going he's like i just want to finish it finish it off let's just finish off my opponent now so rook g1 bishop f8 he's like i i've got this very confident this rook g1 and knight, knight h avoiding the trade of knights very confident because i mean i'm sure you know he, he could have allowed the trade and um would have been fine who's still winning, but but this is maybe turning out to be more decisive. The computer really doesn't like h5. It's saying plus four now almost. It preferred rook c6, which is kind of a weird move, but, but you can see the lateral defense. So h5, uh, a little softness on g6 now because he was a little more solid. Now he's a bit more open. Let's see how he exploits it. Rook g1. Yeah, actually, we'll see that immediately. He exploits it. He's just so, he's just a hawk. Exploit all every piece almost is hitting g6. We've got pressure here, so we have this pin here. We can maybe take on well, we could take on h5 right away. So when he goes here, that's just his threat to take on h5. Um, he comes in here, and even there, see, it looks like Alex Sinkos may be thinking, okay, I'm clogging up the g file. You're, I, I'm basically making your pin moot now. I'm, 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 uh, I'm trying to obstruct that, um, but no, that doesn't work. He still breaks too because well he sees some idea to get through on the light squares so brilliant takes on a takes on h5 and now again like I said the second the second h5 was played there was more softness created his uh, structure became weaker so we get knight g4 knight takes h5 g takes h5 bishop f5 and we could just really I mean he could have gone knight f5 that was sufficient it looks like he could have gone knight f5 check uh, king f6 and then the computer just likes rook f1 and it's just plowing through and continuing his attack. And it's like, well, pieces are equal now. He's actually down two pawns, but who cares, right? And, he, and again, he's solidified his king, whereas whereas Alex Cinco's king is super weak. So Bishop goes to f5. And an interesting, a good good old um, US versus uh, versus USSR match. So like going back to the, the, the good old days of um, Fisher, Fisher versus Spassky, 1973, right? With Fisher uh, working to defeat the Russians. So we have Bishop F5, Bishop E7, 
Bishop takes g4. H takes. And he's just he's just crashing through. So to bishop f5. I mean, yeah, the computer suggests he could run with this king and just get out of there, but it's it's pretty hard. Again, still still rook f1 immediately. So bishop e7, bishop takes, queen takes. Wow, it's saying it's saying the best move for black is bishop g5. Yeah, that's interesting. So so basically Caruana sacrifices a piece, he counter sacrifices. So Alexinko throws away a piece for some pawns. And then Caruana he gives the piece back and he gets the pawns back. But now he's actually he's actually technically still down a pawn right now, but who cares? He has a massive attack. But then Alexenko's best move is to just give him the piece back. Um, oh, and that's what he does, actually. Yeah, he does play his like his only move. So uh, well, this is getting mated, right? And if he goes to F, well, F6, you can't survive this. I mean, this is also getting mated. So yeah, the king is completely exposed. If you walk, well, you're also getting mated. Um Pretty much immediately, if you go here, we have oh we have mate in two after knight f five, and whatever you want to do, queen h five, queen g seven, that's mate also. So it's pretty much over. Um, but he tries bishop g five, and then he gets into h five. So this is this is really interesting. Now at first it's like wait, doesn't he have f six? I mean that would be the only way not to lose. And now of course I mean okay, well he's not he's not going to take on g five. I mean. He's going to be, he's going to have a very long task. It's like, okay, now it's like plus three. It's like, yeah, he's up a piece for a pawn, but it's going to take him forever now to win. So, yeah, he's 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 ready to end things. He's been ready to end things from the second h5 was played, and he just smashed open the king side. Um, so, queen h5, and he resigned, actually, just resigned. But, yeah, but see, now we're going to win the bishop under favorable circumstances, right? We're taking it and we're not trading queens, we're just about to get a checkmate you know, mating attack, leading to mate or winning material. Um, but but this is interesting. If you had gone f6, we have we have a forced mate, actually mate in seven, but you see you can just see how bad it's gonna be after the check. So we, we have another check. So we can keep him keep him out of these squares by the night. And then we're gonna start hitting him on the um, on the light squares as well. If he comes up, what is he walking into? Rookie one? Mate in two, check here. Oh, he can't even go there. He can't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, he's he's covered on. He can't. He's covered covering d5, d6, and d7. Beautiful. So he has nowhere to go. Um, he just blocks, and he gets mated. So wow. I mean, that's how it could have finished. So this is a really nice game. It's just again. So we cover the opening. We cover just to just to recap. We covered the Nimso Indian. Kind of explored some of the possibilities. Talked about some of the ideas for black. We looked at how black needs to strike back and how you know i don't know about what theory is but at least in practice black hasn't hasn't done too poorly in these lines but caruana found something better and um proved that this is really nice idea of coming to d6 and uh yeah the computer didn't do it we didn't want to do it at first i didn't have the computer on earlier but now now the engine switched on so d6 is uh, at first it wanted to do bishop f4 but it realizes it still says like plus 0.3 but i think it doesn't quite understand the depth of it that car i want to saw because it's going to start to you know the advantage will increase uh it actually likes black at this point but who cares it's practical purposes for practical purposes he's doing really well but he's clear the point is that i want to take away from it is that we get this wedge pawn, and that pawn really ties the opponent down and, and, and allows this infiltration with tempo. And, and, and the key is that, that because of this gain of space, really well-placed pieces, the, the rook just has nowhere good to go. And, and he a beautiful move, just retreating the bishop, and uh, he's got nothing to do. He could have gone queen d2, actually, right away. <laughs> actually doesn't like this move either. It says he should have done rooks. No, it says, see, he doesn't realize it. At first, it's like, oh, it's winning for black. And then it starts to realize, no, actually, white's better. So the computer needs to, it's a very deep position where the computer needs some time to, to start to realize how strong it is for Caruana. Um, and then g4 goes for that. And then, we again, we looked at some really complex lines, but some again, kind of like seeing through the center, like realizing, okay, as, as the pieces start clearing off, certain types of endgames, like that one really interesting endgame 
where we just we just get that rook on e7, which that was a really nice line. That was uh, where was I'm not sure where that was, but it was uh, that line where the rook ends up here and the knight gets pinned with the rook here. So just if you go back, that that was a really interesting line, I thought. Um, but yeah, he, he he goes for the take because he just didn't like any of those lines. With really the again the whole theme like there's a lot of lines we looked at, but to to encapsulate it's just this this rook is is just poorly placed and it becomes uh, becomes very uh, uncomfortable and ends up probably having to give itself up. So bishop takes, and then we go after it anyway, and they, we liquidate. And again, the evaluation is that the king is the king's open. A little bit. We're covering it enough. We're up a piece for some pawns, and he still counterattacks. He just uses he just uses the full force of his extra piece. When you're up when you're up material, there's two ways to win. The the fundamental way is you liquidate, right? The ratio of your of your of your piece of your um, piece power increases the more you trade, right? If you have like if you have a nine, to, let's say you're up a piece, uh, ten to nine, or you trade them all down, then you have two to one, right? So then you're, you're then so the more you go down, the closer you get to doubling. So you trade them all off. You get you get two to one, two rooks to one rook or something. That's easy, right? Or whatever, or just a queen and a king versus a king, right? Um, there's less less noise. Eliminate the noise. But the second way is you actually just keep your extra force on the board and use that to overwhelm your opponent. So get h5, rook g1, and yeah, he's oh well, he actually could have sacked on g6, but he comes here. Oh, that's kind of cool. Let's just see how that would how that would play out. So it takes takes. And then you just go. It's kind of hard to see over the board, but it's just cra he's just crashing again. What did I say? Like I I, I mentioned about the H5. I, I didn't know it would be that serious, but H5 was just. And you can see the evaluation shifted a lot the second H5 was played. I'm like, okay, there's got to be something dangerous behind that. But it's this it's this weakening of the G6 point, which enables really nice sacrifices. Um, but yeah, everything collapses here. So um, and it still does in this case, but nine G four. But it's beautiful because even with this, and again, seeing kind of seeing through the pieces, sort of X ray X ray vision you have to have over the chessboard. But the beautiful thing about about well chess is there's perfect information. It's all in front of you. You don't have to imagine what's on the other side of it. You can see it right there. We have bird's eye view. Um, so, but this is hard to see still. Like this um, take, it's more that you're you're getting this. So you're sacrificing here to gain access to this, and we're and the fact that we're going to get H five means this is. So this is falling, right, with tempo. Again, he could have gone out of five check too, but bishop f5 was sufficient, and he, yeah, he just he just crashes through, and he just he, he, it was good enough, you know. He he thought it was good enough, and then queen h5 is crushing, and he resigned. Okay, that was the first one. Second game is let's go back to the game list. That was the game between MVL or Vachier Legrave, I guess, and Dingler Dinglerin. Okay, so we have now we have France. First we had we had uh, U.S. versus Russia. Now we have France versus China. Okay, and let me just make sure everything's working on the channel. <clears throat> yeah, looks like it's on. Uh, oh, I'm green. Okay, it's actually green. Usually, like I guess there's too many people streaming at the same time. Oh, hey, uh, mobile mobile gamers, uh, I saw you earlier, and and Chesnos. Chesnos made a very nice donation. To um, for me to teach a student at two hundred fifty dollars to teach, and I found someone actually to teach a student in need. So thank you, Chess Notes, for that. He said, "Think Queen B six instead of Rook fifteen Queen." Oh, okay, hold on. I mean, let me t let's take a quick look. So and then we'll come back to that. If you guys are still there, so he's saying Queen B six instead of Rook B Rook E six. Black's position is clear and solid. All pieces active. So this was the. Oh, that was the improvement. And uh, and did you do? Uh, if you're still there, did you have you done some previous analysis, or have you seen anyone else analyzing this? The queen b6, or, did, or is that your suggestion? And probably I'm just an average chess player. Yes, very nice line. Uh, the line that chess knows is talking about. I assume is that what you're is that what you're talking about? Pawn and knight for exchange. I think is decent compensation. Pawn and knight for exchange. Oh, are you talking about the end game? Well, if it's if it's the end game situation, that generally would favor the rook pr pretty heavily, because um, the rook can come in there and just use its superior force to pick up all the pawns, right? Um, but let me see what you're talking about real quick with 15 queen b6. So you're saying queen b6, knight c7, bishop. Okay, let's go to that. So uh, where are we? We're on this one. So 
Queen b6, move 15. Let's check it out. Okay, knight b5. And, and yeah, that's the computer suggestion. Okay. And it's saying minus 0 0.1. <laughs> it's just 0 0.1 better for black, according to the computer. Um, but rather than rookie. So it looks to me like rookie 6 was, was, was a mistake. Yeah, that was. I mean, come on. Come on, man. Rookie 6, you're not, you're not even getting off this fork thing. Come on. That's just not very inspiring. Um, I'm sure um, Putin was not happy with that move. So af after rookie 6, bishop f4. So bishop f4 guarding d6. And, hmm. And that's the nice thing about chess. You can't hack that position. Let's see. I mean, you can try, but... I think they have pretty good, they have pretty, you know, classic chess over the board. Yeah, it's like in a high-level tournament, it would be pretty hard to cheat. It's more about the pre-game preparation. So, rookie six, bishop f4. Yeah, this was just bad. And if we go queen b6, and was it knight c6? Oh, oh, right, right. Ah, oh, I see. My bad. So you're talking about, um, uh, okay, you were saying that there's nice compensation uh, for the exchange at this point. Now, what was the line? Was it bishop d6 or something? You were saying queen b6, knight c7, bishop d6, knight takes a, rook takes a. Black's position is, he says, quote, clear and solid, all pieces active. See, he should have learned from Caruana, um, well, that would be before the fact, but, you know, now he knows, right? After seeing Caruana's is crushed, he's like, yeah, maybe I should just focus on peace activity. That's, but, but again, why did that happen? Because of the pawn structure, right? It's because of this. Now, okay, so, so basically Black's sole purpose right now should be eliminate the D6 pawn. And I think that, 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 that summarizes this, right? That D6 pawn is a nuisance. Get rid of it. And that's the whole point. Saying, I'm willing to give you the exchange. Now, I guess this was a similar idea. He's like, no, it's, it's got to be the similar similar idea saying, hey, if you want, well, in this case, actually, tactically, it just doesn't work. But once he gets bishop f4 in, it just looks like a silly move because it's doing nothing. It's a, it's a move. Okay. So queen b6, rather here, queen b6, knight c7. So the line is bishop takes c6. Oh, yeah, I don't even want that rook. I don't want that rook anymore, right? But you have to. <laughs> it's like you take, okay, the rook goes in the corner. Um, yeah, it's equal equal-ish. Three, um, yeah, and that's why he's saying that that um, the second player. Um, we, 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 oh, you can't. I don't think you can see it, but the second um, um, comment coming from Mobile Gamers TV. I just kind of just became a, a YouTube friends there um, recently, and they're having a good conversation about, about Wesley So and Chess 960 and the creativity and everything. Saying, nice line, yeah. Night pawn and knight for exchange is deep. Yeah, more than more than I would say more than decent compensation for sure. Um, it's a game, you know, it's a game. Uh, Alex Cinco would be doing just fine here. And, and you can really start to see, you know, uh, like, I, like I said, there's some, certain weaknesses in, uh, in, in Caruana's position. And, you know, with the extra exchange, you got the bishop aiming in there. You got like the queen. Maybe you get like some type of later on, some type of battery going. Uh, you get some real pressure here. And the bishop's coming back here. Okay, lots of lines, but point is pieces are aiming into white's position. And the extra pawn is, again, that's the one that's keeping Black's king airtight. Well, okay, we might want a little air, right? We, we might want to, okay, you come back, maybe you play h6, maybe you get some get in the loof. But, yeah, Black's doing well. So that's really, and I think that's interesting that he pointed that out because I think that's kind of a turning point. After rookie six, it's almost as if it was like, as if it was like a forced win by Caruana. Caruana just swept the board. Okay, so let's look at game two. And I mentioned this was between... Uh, MVL and uh, Ding. Now, I think MVL was playing with the white pieces, was he not? E4, E5. Yeah, he was playing with white. Okay, so let's check this one out. And, um, okay. Let's go back. So, yeah, that was, um, I'm going to try and be a little more concise. I think I got pretty got pretty long-winded on that one. But there was a lot to look at, for sure. So, let's see. Now, this one, I, I mean, that was a really nice game. And, again, like Caruana's games, it's, he he's just playing like like a, a machine, you know. Caruana is playing like a um, like a very creative, like like the new computers, which are which have eliminated their old weaknesses of being, you know, very materialistic and boring, and just like brute calculating machines. And now and now they're creative essentially, right? Because the new algorithms 
that um, and the inspiration of Alpha Zero is sort of ne using neural networks, um, and, and and essentially, Caruana has sort of like taken that on himself. So he's like he's a hot, he you know like a lot of the top players. These going back to there's, there's an essay called um, Gary Kasparov is a um, not a cyborg. Um, yeah, I think it is. Gary Kasparov is a cyborg, and you know it's interesting that it's mentioned about Anand in the in the documentary about Carlson, but um, uh, it's just all the players, these the top players since Fisher. I think Fisher saw that come. But Fisher basically played like a computer without before computers, right, or before chess computers were around, um, or any or anything good. Um, but uh, you got you got Kasparov, Anand, top players today. Obviously, you know Topala was Topalov and. Um, you know, other players that became world champions recently. Of course, they, they use computers a ton. And so they it's like a meld, right? This is this, this Android uh, hybrid. So, um, yeah, but Caruana with his $12,000 computer is is, is uh, doing some amazing things. And, he, and he's just a very creative player as well, very precise. So, uh, and now, M and MVL is a great player too. So is, so is Ding Loren. So, so E4, E5, which is interesting. So we get, this is the, the, the Knights, the Knight, King's Knight opening normal variation. Okay, well, it's not going to stay normal for long. Bishop b5, Roy Lopez a6. I mean, you got to love the Roy Lopez. It's just, it's classic. The fact that it's been around for so long, uh, over 100 years, and yet people still find it fascinating at the top levels and every level. Um, it's just a great opening. You know, white just white just gets comfortable development, applies some pressure, but black has his chances too. So, Bishop a4, Knight f6. And you don't have to guard the pawn because you don't want to, you know, if you take, you got to worry about the e-file. Obviously, you, you can take in the open variation, but this should be seven. Rook e1. And for those for those people um, who aren't familiar with it, just quickly, so if you take, and, I, and I'm not even an expert um, in this at all. I usually play like the English or um, I've been liking b3 recently, kind of more like offbeat variations. And it's been working pretty well. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but um after knight takes e4, I think you could go like d4 right away, or you can go rook e1. The, the opening theory, uh, the main move here is d4, yeah, yeah, d4. Because the thing is that you can't, you don't really want to take. Uh, actually, I think even taking is a move, but you run into this, and, and um, the book says that, that you got to play. Yeah, f5 just, eh, that's a little sketchy. You got to develop. You don't want to open up your, your you don't want to open up that diagonal leading, oop, not that. You want to, don't want to open up that diagonal leading to your king. So you'll go d5. Now we really you're pinned here, and then the knight just takes back, and you know white's more comfortable there. Um, but white wins like 32%, and black wins 21%. But this is not really that common of a line, I, I think, to take it. If you go d4, generally speaking, um, they're gonna let's see, is it, you hit this one. I think the main the main line is b5, bishop b3, and then they got d5. And they allow the pawn to take and you know, just give the pawn back. And then bishop e6 is the main move there. So yeah, there's various lines like that. But you, you can take it. There's an open version. Um, but I think more or the, the Berlin comes out of the um, out of the out of the open. Uh, the famous Berlin, which is like a very drawish line. Um, but still some some sting to it. Uh, but after bishop e7, then we're probably gonna get more of a closed. So rook e1. Now he guards it. Now that the king, see the king is protected now. So now there's fewer tricks on the e-file. So the second you see that, then you want to play um, rook e1 to guard it. And then, well now, and actually you're, you're threatening to take. It didn't work earlier, keep in mind, to, um, for example, here, you take back with a d-pawn, and you take, you take here. This is just not good, I think. Nobody does that. There actually weren't any games like that. Well, these are master games, okay? They know this. Because you're attacking this and this, and yeah, it's not pleasant. And, and black just has like the bishop pair going into an end game, I guess. After this, it just doesn't look very good for white. White's not getting anything out of that, um, other than double pawns. Who cares? Black has good development. Black is doing really well. Okay. So anyway, just just to give you a quick idea, if in case you weren't familiar with the Roy Lopez, so bishop e7. And again, it's not my specialty, but um, rook e1, b5. More like I definitely know the dragon really well. Karl Kahn know pretty well now, Scandinavian, things like that. But I never really got into E. I never played E5 as black. It's kind of I felt like it's kind of boring. Uh, but it does, but there is definitely some 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 life to it. Okay, B5, a lot of theory too. Uh, Bishop B3, castles. But again, the, the point is that after this, once the rook comes out, 
Now we really can take on c6 and win e5, which is why black plays b5. Now keep in mind, sometimes b5 can be a weakening move. Uh, yeah, you're gaining space, you're gaining a tempo on the bishop, but anytime, I talked about this in the last video, that anytime you move your b-pawn or your, or your g-pawn, you're really, you're, keep in mind, you're weakening the, pawn, the, uh, the squares on both sides. There's no pawn here, and you know, on this one, there's no pawn here to guard it, right? So this is just going to, um, there's going to be weaknesses in here, and you can strike with, once you, uh, everything's covered. Once you go back to b3, you can strike with a4 and hit this one. Okay, so bishop b3, castles. And, you, and you'll see this a lot. I've even seen, I've seen Fisher doing this too. Because I often, if I want to teach my students the Roy Lopez, I'll say, hey, look at some Fisher games. Because Fisher truly mastered the Roy Lopez with the white pieces. And actually, even, even in his 92 match, 20 years later, when he plays Spassky again and he beat him again, um, he, he first game, beautiful Roy Lopez. So study, if you want to study the Roy Lopez, just look at some classic Fisher games. H3, Bishop B7, D3. So, uh, you know, I'm seeing this a lot these days. You know, uh, um, this, this kind of more compact version of the Roy Lopez with the Italian game as well, with the Italian when the bishop goes to C4. But not, you know, this kind of like almost seems less ambitious. And I was talking with a student about this recently who wants to kind of like just go for the central breaks right away, which is fine for initiative. But you can also play a little more like, I think maybe that's also avoiding avoiding uh, computers and stuff a little bit too, is you're just kind of getting your pieces out, right? You're just, you're just uh, you know, getting like some solid development. And then you can play like C3. You can do your little knight maneuver with knight D2 to F1 to G3 or E3. And you're, you're going to hit the F5 square as well as the D5 square in some, if you go to E3. So you do these kinds of things and you sort of just like wait and see, develop, get comfortable development. You punch back with a4 against, like I said, against this pawn, which could be a liability for black. So, you know, black, white is just, white just has that solidity. Now, black often, a lot of those lines where the knight moves, you might get c5 in. Um, black might get a little space, but take on some weakness. So, again, imbalances. You're going to have imbalances. But it's a little more of subtle play, right? So d3, d6. You're not going for the kill right away, obviously. a3. Oh, what happened to the music? We got Moonshiner Prohibition Strike. I have like some type of jazz. So my like Gypsy Jazz video pause. Yes, continue watching. What are you trying to do here? Okay, there we go. Yeah, YouTube and YouTube and its ads are uh, pretty annoying. Used to be, yeah, used to just be no ads, you know, like, like barely any ads. Now it's just like flooded with ads. All right, so we have. I want us to subscribe. Okay, um, let's go back. To this one okay so we have a3 let's look at the rest of the game so a3 queen d7 and knight c3 is actually the main move and, and you can see like it's not the most adventurous it's but i imagine it's well it's actually the most common move it was 251 like this and 135 played like this now again like i said you can go knight bd2 to f1 to g3 or e3 fisher would often go to e3 actually sometimes even go to d5 um, with the knight. Um, but knight c3, okay, it scores like 17% wins for white. And the other one, 28%, right? I think it's kind of a strategy to get his opponent, opponent like, well, I was going to say out of the book, but it is the most common move. It's just not that, doesn't seem that ambitious. Again, but I think what we're seeing is like, it, 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 it's like the rewriting of theory because of computers. So whatever the percentage is, who cares? You're finding some line that works for you based on your home preparation. And the fact that 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 that, that um, statistically it doesn't look as good for you is actually it, it is better for you if it works out because you can lead your opponent down this trap like oh of course this is good for black so they go into it and you catch it okay rook f e eight so that's kind of one of the, I'll say that is one of the more interesting parts of of home preparation you, you can try and mislead your opponent and stuff so there is something to it for professional players rook f e eight d two it's very modest right I mean. Look, I mean, imagine you're at 1,200, 1,500, 1,800. You can play all these moves, right? There's, there's no secret to what White has done here, to what, what MBL has done. He's, uh, oh, and by the way, why did he play A3? I should explain that. Um, the second he played, okay. So, now, Black doesn't want to go Knight A5 and come after the Bishop. It just wouldn't make sense because you'll just, you'll just win the pawn. And okay, yeah, sure, you could take a Bishop. Who cares? I mean, you just take back and you open up the Rook. Uh, and you put pressure on the A6 pawn. But, yeah, it's a pawn. It's just a clean pawn. So what he does is the second d6 is played, 
that's guarded. So now knight a5 is possible, and he's able to um, and yeah, he's able to do that without worrying about losing the uh, e5 pawn. Okay, so we have a3, queen d7, knight c3. So we have a little, yeah, we have a little cave for the bishop to go into. And again, yeah, I, th I think knight bd2 is more natural to go to f1, but it's just a different plan. So knight c3, rook f8, bishop d2, and, and again, just, just, it's interesting. Super modest development, I mean, and, and there's no, there's no mystery to what he's done. Just developing, kind of aiming over here, you know, when you can move. And not to mention, you know, um, you can still play knight e2 to g3. Don't forget about that. Just because you didn't do your fancy little knight d2 to f1 maneuver doesn't mean you can't still do it from c3 to e2 to g3 to get to f5, right? Still, and, and, and so why f5? Kasparov said, um, you know, if you get knight on f5, it's like you have an attack, something like that. So it's just, you know, your pawns are like this. This is what you're aiming here, you're aiming here, right? Black is aiming for dark squares, white's aiming at the light squares. So again, pawns the soul of chess, right? Should say it down there. It keeps coming back to that. F5. Okay. So bishop d2, knight d8. Interesting. So we might see some uh, c5 action here, getting space. Maybe you can reroute the knight to e6. And once again, maybe maybe uh, we're getting this f4 stuff coming. Maybe black, uh, maybe you can, can even go here, get the knight on h5, and get both knights aiming in on f4 and kind of start to strike at these squares uh, around white's king so maybe black can get a counterattack. gotta be careful okay and black does go all out you'll see it's really interesting very a lot of tension in this game knight g5 okay it goes right for knight g5 and is this okay wow that's interesting so in terms of the um the precedent here this has been played six times that in this free database it's been played six times and all six games were draws so again like it's go, using using theory as a guide essentially um, it just seems like it's a drawish line, is what I would guess, um, based on the results. But I guess he found something else, right? Knight d5, knight takes d5, pawn takes d5, and now, okay, this is interesting. So here, here Ding uh, diverges. So in the past, three players played c now, now we're talking about 2,300 players. So that's nothing for these guys, right? These guys are like 2,700 level. So we're talking about um, 400 points lower, right? Um, so just just a totally different level, but some you know strong some pretty strong masters have played all played c6. So ding ding diverges. He goes c5. Okay, and then we're out of the book. All right. So now as I talked about, we have this a4 thrust to strike at b5, and and also you're able in, in the Fisher game, in, uh, Fisher versus Spassky 92 first game one of their match. Um, I forget was it played in New York. I forget what it was played, but after or maybe it was played in uh, maybe it was played in Iceland again. You have to check that out. But after this. Um, takes, I don't know when Fisher was allowed like back in the US or what the deal was, but Fisher ends up tripling up on the A-file. So you can see it just immediately gives you options for the uh, A-file action. So I, again, I, I just like to use Fisher's games as, mo as models for the Roy Lopez. Uh, and now we're seeing more modern treatment of it too. Um, now, as for this pawn, you can see, I mean, it, it might become a liability, uh, but at the moment it is keeping the knight out, right? The knight has nowhere to go because you can see that he he wanted to go to e6 and to f4, but he, he was denied that. Okay, now now he's now, now uh, you can see that MBL is starting to gain some space. f5, a takes b5, a takes b5, and he takes on a8, leaving the bishop undefended for now on a8. But it does give him an escape square. Well, the knight, I think the knight will probably go to f7 and kind of create some action here. He, he wants to start pushing his kingside pawns and, you know, he's got his pawns aiming this way, got two pawns that are mobile. mobile. He wants to get three of them and just start, you know, striking, just keep striking, right? But you'll see there are costs to that, obviously, because the more you push your pawns, the more you potentially create weaknesses. So bishop takes a8, c4, knight f7. Now c4, <clears throat> why did he do that? That's an interesting move. Um, you might say, you know, on the surface, it's like, hey, you're making your bishop even worse. But no, there's there's a lot more to it than that. Um, because look, the bishop's already bad on this diagonal. Let's just we just have to come to terms with that. That's not that's not where the bishop's going to seek activity. And actually, the bishop is a ba is babysitting. We don't want to have a babysitting bishop on on d5. So we're going to use our c pawn to hold our d pawn. And then if if um, if he takes, well, we have we have this. We're going to pick up the rook. Not just an exchange. It's a whole rook, right? 
Look at that. So, yeah, that's game. Right. So we don't. You don't need a computer for that. Uh, I think that was. So that was the tactical point. And I mean, hey, he, he can probably just, he does take, yeah, he's just gonna take on B5 because you still can't take back. You can't take either one. So it's like, yeah, he, he wins a pawn, but it's not like the most attractive pawn. Um, the knight, well, so Ding does the right thing, I think, by just getting his knight out and preparing to strike over here. Seems like, oh, look, he's gotta do something. Now notice that, notice that Ding's bishop though is awful, right? That's a problem for him. His bishop is just really bad, and that's I think that's one of the strategic ideas that MVL had was just play against the bishop. Now the three A guard questions, A guard's questions. Um, uh, I, well, I saw it in positional play, which uh, thank you Vishnu for lending me that. I got him and got I messed up his book, so I got him a new one coming coming for him right now in the mail. Uh, I'm keeping the old the old version with uh, ripped up or like pieces falling off the uh, paper falling off the binding. Um, but it's a great book and he talks about, so the three, the three things that he asks are, um, where are the weaknesses? What is my opponent trying to do? And what's my opponent's worst piece? So that, and that it's interesting because those three questions can kind of, you know, kind of encapsulates all, all of chess strategizing in some ways. I mean, along with, I would combine that with Silman's, you know, imbalances and things like that. But what's my, what's my worst piece and my point? Well, actually at the moment, they're both kind of the worst piece. But you see, what he's trying to do is make this permanently the worst piece, and then be able to make this one on b3. Well, not only activate it, but win the rook with it, right? <laughs> win the exchange or something. So um, that's the hope. So he's dealing with his worst piece. It's very smart. And the bishop on d2 is already pretty good. The knight on f3 has got some influence, right? It's good defender. He can, he's covering g5. He's got some uh, looking at f5. Maybe he'll want to strike with f4 later, move it out of the way and strike back or something. The rook, so he's got a lot of pressure in the center. What's he going to do with it? Let's see. But I do like this idea of c4 and um, guarding his pawn, making the bishop worse, and in some cases, activating his own bishop on the diagonal. Okay, so c takes b5, g5, knight h2, king g7. Ah, this is nice. You'll see this a lot, kind of against King's Indian. I've seen a lot of Rashevsky, Rashevsky games like that against King's Indian. Um, you'll see a Petrosian, very nice Petrosian wins too. Um, so knight h2, king g7. When you see those pawns start pushing forward, f pawn, g pawn, <clears throat> to prove that it's overextended. Now, he goes bishop c4, he's like, hey, look, if you're not going to take my ugly doubled pawn, I'm going to keep that ugly doubled pawn on b5. So he's just going to hold on to those pawns for now. The interesting thing is that by taking, yeah, he did make this hard to defend. But then again, how is black going to attack it? Not really. Um, you know, he might even play for b4. He does. I see that uh, in several moves. He plays b4, undoubles his pawns. And this is a, this is a real asset on b5. It, it, was, it looked, again, it looked ugly. But you have to have the foresight to realize that this doubled pawn, once it becomes undoubled, it's a monster, right? You can get your queen around there. You can get your rook over. So maybe our play is just going to be to shove the pawn down the board. And I... Yeah, that's how he wins the game, actually. To so give me, oh, okay, not to give it all away, but but that's a big, I'll just say that's an important part of his victory. We'll get to that. Um, it's going to be that, and it's going to be, just look very closely at these pawns. Okay. Uh, false sense of security. King g6. Okay, I'm like, hey, I got a big center. I can just sort of push my king shelter forward to the fourth rank and just chill on the, on the or rather, well, his fourth rank and chill on his third rank and old notation, or in this case, uh, sixth rank and fifth rank. Um, so king g6. Now this is the key idea. Now, I mean, king g6 really provokes this move, but it kind of, it kind of leads MVL to find, which I think is the right idea. Um, let's see, I'm curious whether the computer agrees, whether it sees some other things. You know, the computer is, is content with just playing on the queen side. At first, at first, ah, uh, yeah, now it's coming around. It's coming around. It's still, it's still shifting. It's like, do I want queen b3? Do I want b4? And then it sees this g4 idea. Yeah, and then, it, and then it comes back to g4 again. It was actually settling on queen b3, but that was, you know, it's got to get deeper into it, right? And then it's like, well, okay, just think about it. Why is g4 a strong move? And like I said, this is the move that, um, well, Ryshevsky has done it more as like, as like a restraining idea. Kind of, we're talking about the Nimzo Indian more of restraining against the King's Indian to stop f5. Petrosian did it, um, at least in one version that I recall, 
when that he has pawn a pawn on f4, he makes an exchange in the center, and then he punches back with g4. Actually, no, a couple times he did that in a, in a really beautiful English win as well. Um, English c4, one c4 opening. So uh, yeah, g4 is just um, is just going to be really striking at the, striking at the white squares. So bishop c4, king g6, g4. Knight h6. Oh, I know, I left it in there. Oh, baby's up. <laughs> He's good. Um, so, g4. Knight h6. No, it was, it was with him. No, it was, he had it. Okay. Maybe he needs to go in a minute to help him out. But, um, let's see. g4. Knight h6. Queen f3. So, put, putting pressure. Yeah, I, okay, I'm going to have to pause. Come right back. Uh, baby awake. Get the uh, video back up. Sorry about that. Fatherhood calls, um, but he's good now. Okay, video capture. I think I just have to like open that thing back up again. Video capture. Uh, deactivate. Reactivate. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. All right. So where were we? Um, we were on, okay, so I was getting to some of like the sort of historical examples of playing g4 against this kind of structure with, um, generally speaking, yeah, with e5, f5, g5. Now, what's the idea? Again, just to, just to break it down, basically what you want to, what you want to do, again, we're talking about attacking weak squares, like Agar's question, where are the weaknesses? Well, weaknesses are on the light squares. You got to see through that, right? Once again, if there's, if there's a pawn that's not guarded by any pawns, it's a weak pawn, essentially. Some are weaker than others, um, like this one, for example. It looks like it might be weak. It's guarded by the bishop, at least. But once you once you un, once you undouble your pawns, well, it's a string that's easy to guard from the B file, <clears throat> from B3, from A4. So, King G6, G4. So G4, yeah. We're, we're, we think about it. Why is it so strong on the light squares? You're just breaking through. You're breaking through on the white squares in particular. Knight g6. Well, he's probably looking to get his queen to e4 as well. So you can you can know like he's going to go queen f3. Can get our queen here, and it's just like again, it, it just I don't, I'm not really sure I understand why Ding played king g6. Was it like was that a good move? I mean, it's. Maybe it was provocative. Like I said, I, my first inclination, it was like a false sense of security. It's like, hey, I just, I have this nice little, I, this king, king's king got a loft, right? He's got all these pawns guarding him. He's good. Uh, but it turns out he's, he, this can all topple down. So g4, strike in f5, knight h6, queen f3. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it's like it, you're not really going to win anything yet, but it's just it's just pressure. Don't never en- underestimate the power of just long term pressure. It doesn't need to lead to anything immediately. Just sustained pressure. Okay, Bishop D8. So he's kind of clearing the rook and the, the seventh rank for the queen. Maybe he can shift the bishop somewhere. Okay. Well, his idea was bishop b6, as we'll see. He does that in two moves. Okay, queen g2. So now we can see, look at that. He's got the, he's got the idea of coming here later on, and once we trade, or he tra- one of them trades. Plus, he's got the idea of the x-ray. So, so this king has just got to feel very uncomfortable, right? So he says, okay, okay, I've had enough. I'm going to play f4 and shut you down. And then he's like, well, I'm coming to, oh, I'm going to strike with b4. Then I'm coming to e4, right? So he strikes with b4, like I said, he's undoubling the pawns and making this pawn a monster on b5, which is ready to plow through. And also if you take on c5 and he takes back, we can have another pass pawn and we can have a weak pawn to a target on c5. But you don't, you don't want to take too fast. But the thing is, another thing, because when you take too fast, you might drop, no, you're not really going to drop it though. Look at this, this queen is serving like a, it's like a Fion Kettled queen protecting d5 combined with this. And the thing is, keep in mind, you know, just these these little nuances. Okay, pop quiz. Why does b4 attack the e5 pawn? Which in turn attacks the king. So b4 attacks the king. Look at that. That's an aggressive pawn, isn't it? The whole board's connected because of the pawn structure. Why? Because b4, think about maybe pause it and think about it. Because this is sometimes more important than like a tactical puzzle. B4 is a very strategic move. Again, you're undoubling the pawn, so it's got it's a it's a it's it's got its purely queen side objectives. It has its uh, of the B pawn. It, it targets this one, but when you take this back, you hit the E pawn more, which is going to be relevant, really relevant, because knight's coming to F3, bishop's going to C3, one, two, three attackers, and you're out on E5, right? Okay, so we got this, this, this. Queen e4 check, right? So we're hitting, so look at this. I mean, we're, we're getting to the diagonal like we wanted to do, and the knight's gonna get to f3. I mean, okay, yeah, you're, you may not you may not be able to get everything you want. You may not get the pawn to take back. So we may not, we may not be able to collapse e5 yet, but are we gonna be able to pile up on it? Absolutely. So king g7, b takes e5. Oh wait, he does actually take with the d. Now that just looks a little, Ding, I don't know. Ding made a couple of weird moves here. Maybe Ding was like in time pressure, or psycho- psychologically something was, I don't know. He's just made a couple of strange moves. It just doesn't doesn't make sense to me. Like why the king went to g6 and then why the bishop didn't take, rather, why the bishop didn't take back on c5. Because like when you take with a d pawn, okay, evaluation, the computer's evaluation goes from plus 2.7 to plus four. So, I mean, it just it just seems like, but but why? Why? Because, because again, like I said, this is a target on e5. This is a target on c5 and it blocks your bishop. I just, what's the reasoning here? Is it, I think maybe he's a wor- worried about d4. Maybe, is it immediately gonna work? Bishop c3 also, and then d4. And we got the, we got a pin on this line. So it's gonna be, oh wow, that's interesting. So d4, bishop takes, because it, it, remember it's as if the bishop is loose. Since we have we have, well, not not loose to the queen, but essentially it's loose to anything else but the queen, because the queen's obviously not going to take. But um, but if we get the knight on f3, so effectively the knight's just attacking it. You can't take back because we're going to win the rook, right? So effectively you're attacking the bishop and you're hitting g5. So so when you so when you play d4, you're you're effectively and if you take back, you're effectively losing the, the g pawn. So now the d3 pawn is connected to the g5 pawn. It's amazing, right? And that, and that's again tied to the b pawn, removing the c pawn. Yeah, and, and that's I guess the reason why he didn't take back with with the, with the bishop, even though on, on its face, it still seems like that's the best move because you really don't want to have to make this ugly move. Now, why is it so ugly? It blocks the bishop. It splits the pawns. It's just really important in in evaluating. Again, forget about the lines. The lines matter. But I don't care how many moves you can calculate if you can't give me a good evaluation of what happens at the end of that line or or at various uh, you know nodes when we're branching branching off. You have to know what's going to happen at the end of those lines. 
So, and, and, and going forward, just like a, a, um, a, a, an intuitive sense, uh, your positional evaluation. Knight F3, Knight F7, and that's a beautiful position. I mean, it's just domination. <clears throat> really nice example of positional domination. Now, now, the Knight on F7 is actually doing pretty well guarding this and this, right? Guarding E5 and, and G5. But, yeah, the bishops are just they're really nice, you know? Look at that. The, aim, the key is that you're targeting e5. You're tying him down to g5. We have one. Again, no, we have, wow, the, almost everything. One, two, three, and backed up by the rook. Four attackers. We only have two defenders. So, if anything, black should be overprotecting this point. It's a weak spot. If this collapses, well, now the king, because he made this silly move, his only way back was to go here, back into the line of fire, and he just wants to go back again. But now he goes back here. Now he's walking into the X-ray of the bishop once the once the pawn pushes or something. So it's just the the king has no refuge. And look at look at. Meanwhile, it's very important. You know that could be a decisive factor in a lot of games. It's just the fact that you have a safer king, like games where you sacrifice the exchange or something for a pawn or whatever it is, like we talked about earlier. But if you're the one with the safer king, then that's all that matters. You know that 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 safe king just gives you so much more leeway. Meanwhile, your opponent's king is like, it just opens up so many tactical possibilities for you. They always have to be worried, worried about it. So bishop goes to c7 to guard that. Boom, b6, beautiful. Well, that's a tactical idea to remove the defender, but it's tied to this positional theme of overwhelming the pressure on the, um, over, overloading the bishop, overwhelming pressure on e5. So the bishop has to retreat. And look, but look at this past pawn now, right? So queen goes to f5, beautiful idea. Um, he probably didn't even have to. The computer's recommending just going to b1 and supporting the advance of the pawn, and that's good enough. But this is nice because he he saw the strength of this end game. So when you go to f5, and what is he to do, right? I mean, I mean, MVL has this beautiful attack, so he's like, okay, fine, I'll trade queens and hopefully draw the end game. But remember, this bishop still never got in the game. Um, and then he's like, well, I'm going to move my king forward again. And this time he thinks he's getting away with it. But no, he's still not getting away with it. Well, now, now why is, well, why is knight to so strong? Well, the queen was using it. Now the knight's going to take it, take up residence on e4, hit the king, and still putting pressure on g5. And the putting pressure, well, you're threatening to just fork and take the c5 pawn and push the pawn and then win the bishop. So every, it's amazing. It's really, really, I, I think, I mean, Caruana's game, again, was interesting from a, uh, tactical and just yeah, very abstract perspective. This is just a, a beautiful case of you know weak squares using your pawn structure and incre structure incredibly well, and that gives you those opportunities for your minor pieces to to just infiltrate. Look at that square. So what does he do? He, um, does knight d6 even work? No, um, knight d6 because he he needs to stop knight e4 if you can. Now why do you think he decided against knight d6? I'm wondering. I think knight g5 is strong. Knight d6. It says he could. Well, what are we at right now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4. I mean, if he really wants to, he can go 94, <clears throat> 94 check. Nah. Rook b1 still, it says, is winning. Rook b1. King takes f5. And you're just kind of putting all your weight behind this pawn. Um, okay, let's say, I don't know, bishop b7 to blockade. Uh, we're just taking c5. It's just domination. We're putting pressure here, and we're trying to get in there. We're trying to remove the blockader eventually. Maybe even here, maybe you trade there. Take on b7 and play bishop a6 or something to remove to remove the blockader. And it's, it's pretty hard to hold that. Okay. Um... But it's really interesting that MVL was content to just trade into this endgame. He was confident enough, but he has this really cool idea. Okay, so he goes d6. He sacrifices this. He doesn't even go for the 94 check. He just goes d6. Now, he, he I'll show you he could have done something else first, but that'll give it away. Uh, d6. Rook takes d6. Now, what about knight takes d6? Is it similar? I think the key is that the bishop is opening up. If knight takes, oh, this is falling now. So now remember, um, oh right, yeah. So same thing. If you go, if he, uh, 
no, Rook D8, where before the Rook was guarding D, E5. So the Rook moves away, and then he's trying to detract, de you know, pull the Knight away from that. And, well, what about, okay, what about Bishop takes D6? What's going on now? It's saying Rook A1, and we're getting to A7, infiltration. It's just really hard to hold this position. I mean, your king is a target. These pawns are like, these pawns flying at you. The bishop, so look at that bishop who's bad for a while. He suddenly opened up. Both of his bishops are amazing. The knight can come in anytime you want. The rook's going to take the A file. Just look at, just like with the game, uh, just like with the car, uh, with the, with the uh, Caruana game, where his pieces were so much better than his opponents. You know, so um, rook takes d6, rook b1, knight d8. So, so you can see the point is just to. I just want to play b7 and win the bishop. Make it give it up. If he doesn't do anything, you're going to get a queen. So he tries to blockade, but amazingly, he still has b7. And that's what I was going to say, that I didn't want to give it away, because he actually even had that move, apparently. Uh, he could have done it here, I think it was. b7, maybe it wasn't quite as strong. But it's like bishop takes, what was the line? Rook b1. What if the rook bishop goes back? You hit the... No, now we get our check in. King goes back. And we can take on c5. We can go to the a5. It's pretty dominant. Um, but still, I, I think this is a little less concrete. But it says it's plus three points something. It's a little less concrete. So he goes d6. But you just have to... Just just that sense. That sense. Like you have, an ob you have an obligation to unleash the fury of your pieces, basically. Right? Your pieces must be unleashed. And... You know that should be your top your top priority at uh, not not to win a pawn. You know he just throws his pawn away because he's going for it's all about position. Rook takes d6, rook b1. Now, okay, not to say there aren't times where you can just pick up some pawns and win that way, but that's not what's going on here. This is a different way to win here. Um, rook b1, knight d8, and of course it's more gratifying so if you can win by sacrificing and just overwhelming position. And now why does b7 work? Okay, let's look at both moves. So now. Bishop takes, then he goes here, he resigns. Beautiful. So it's it's like, okay, yeah, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to take on d8 and take on b7. But the amazing thing is that there's literally just, there's no defense to that. Think about it. Like, think about all the options black has. You can't, because the problem is he's pinned, right? You can't move the bishop because the bishop behind it. So that's where b7 really um, exploited that. So if he goes to anywhere he goes, you take on b8. Um, so the bishop can't move. Well, the knight can't move because you take on b B7. Well, he can take a. Oh, that's tricky. No, he could take a five, but then you take uh, then then you take on b8, and when he takes on c4, we take back with obviously not the pawn. Oh, we get a fork. And uh, king here. Oh, and then we just take back with the pawn because that'll be kind of annoying. Like, there's no need to take back with a knight because then you give him a little more compensation for. I mean, you're still up a piece, but. We don't need to give him that pawn because the, the nice thing about this move, see, you can't take, you don't want to take now because then you, oops, now you get, get the piece back. So what you want to do is toss in the check. I mean, yeah, we're just going to be up an exchange. I mean, this is probably still winning too, but obviously we're just going to be up a piece. And now we're hitting the C5 pawn. And if he tries to guard it, well, then we can take the G5 pawn, right? Or the H7 pawn. I mean, everything. Everything's collapsing. We have a nice pass pawn here. Protected knight under attack, winning position, easy win. King goes to uh, king goes to f8. Knight takes g5, and that's your end. You're winning everything, and you got this trio, just overwhelming. Um, just up, and most well, you're up a piece, but with with again with the, still with the overwhelming position didn't didn't vanish. Okay, king e7. No, that no, he didn't he didn't play on. He resigned after. Um, Bishop a5. There's just no defense to you're losing a piece and you're left with awful pieces. Um, pretty sad situation. Um, but hey, I mean, you got to give it to MVL. He just played an amazing game. Really beautifully played. Uh, really, again, a lot of abstraction, though, in terms of like kind of seeing through the power of the pieces. Like the fact that he did the b4, b4, he took on b5, got those ugly looking pawns, but he saw deeper, right? It was all about the piece activity. But now, now what about knight takes b7? Uh, that seems like another plausible attempt. Oh, that's amazing. You just go, you can, you can, well, okay, it's, it's losing in every way. Um, 
everything's going to start collapsing. But look at this. This is, this is interesting. You could just go rook a1, and he can't even defend this one right here. You could just take the bishop on a8. It's just a, just a loose piece that falls. Um, but uh, it, you, you can also, I mean, because when he takes, he's blocking his bishop. He's obstructed. So you can just toss in this fork again, and the king takes, and you take. And are we still getting the bishop? I think we're still getting the bishop. Because if he takes this way, he loses the bishop on b8. Everything collapses. That's the point. It's a domino effect at this point. You can't guard a8. So then everything falls. He's going to be up a... He's going to just be up a clean rook then. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so really nice play. And again, just to recap this game. Um, also really complex. But, but it's interesting. You know, like I said, is he didn't do anything too fancy. You know, you can play like this. You can play... You can learn the opening, but... It's not that hard to play like this, right? He just he stops any tricks on g4. He makes a pawn chain. He creates a little a little loof, I guess, a little air for the bishop. Uh, and he just brings his pieces out naturally, you know. But this was a little trickier. We does the, the knight d5 idea. Um, and you know, it looks like the bishop's bad, but he just handled the structure incredibly well. He opens the a file, and remember, I said that bishop's hanging on a8. Well, it was hang it it continued to hang on a8 the entire game. It's just a loose piece, and that really cost him in the end. And then the again the foresight to to play a move like c4. Um, well, again, it's a tactical justification. It kind of just wins a pawn actually. As long as I mean, unless you play, what if he plays like rook f8? You still take, and then let's say the queen takes. Um, amazing. Then we have this sacrifice. Takes, takes, and push. Um, <laughs> amazing. As you take here with a fork. Oh, no, no. The knight can block. It's not a fork. But take on e7. Where it comes behind. And then we get to take on e5. Because the bishop is pinning the knight. And we actually guard that. So at 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. And you're up, you're up a couple pawns. Okay, you want to threaten checkmate. No problem. And I will just... Um, counterattack like this it even says that white can play queen f3 and completely be winning after takes takes let's say the bishop takes finally gets in the game um oh you just pick this up hitting this one he takes this one oh oops <laughs> it's just it's a fork and it's enabled by this pin right amazing i mean everything kind of collapses so so this just worked out incredibly well the c4 it's actually sort of in some lines just blasting the center and even though it's blocking the bishop in some lines it opens up after a sacrifice in the capture um otherwise if it captures here in some lines you might go to a4 and hit this way so c4 is not as it's, the bishop looks bad but it's sort of a temporary thing but yeah, but but um ding's bishop on a8 is more permanent unfortunately for him uh, he, I think he had to find a way to reroute. Maybe, maybe uh, if, he, if he could do it again, maybe he'd find a way to like get to c8 or something like that. I don't know. It's just not be. It doesn't belong on a8. Um, takes. What's my worst piece? If you ask those a guard questions, well, get that worst piece to a better square. All right. Knight h2. King g7. Bishop c4. King g6. And, and again, just a beautiful move, g4. So so we end up, we have, okay, another theme of the game. You get the pawns pushing on the king's side, and we punch back with g4, hit the light squares. We had some tactical things going on, but really nothing too fancy. I mean, it was it was very, I mean, highly uh, advanced game, um, but it's very straightforward, too. You know, the queen kind of, like, tucks away, guards everything, and you just strike on the light squares. You undouble your pawns. You check on the light squares. The king is misplaced. You take it. You can't take back because there's deep variation we looked at with uh the d4 oops the d4 push and the knight to f3 beautiful idea um because it's just like that's what happens when you have this again just awesome placement of your pieces and the in this case the opponent's king is really badly placed whereas um um what's his name again alex Sink, alex Sinko's king was was better placed than ding's king um but ding's king just really got him in trouble and keep in mind even in caruana's game his king was open but the placement wasn't that bad because, because you know, somebody could generalize and say, oh, anytime you have no pawns in front of your king, it's weak. Not there because the piece activity was so so ideal for Caruana and his opponent's pieces were so backward that he was able to cover his king easily and his piece activity and extra piece just won out. Okay, so it seems like he's holding it together, but bishop c3 just cements the advantage and, and just awesomely placed pieces. Queen goes to f5 and it's just, it's just awful, awful situation. Queen takes, G takes, King F6. Uh, beautiful, beautiful re rerouting of the knight to place it here. Um, just a really, really ma masterpiece, I'd say. It's 
I mean, both again, both games are beautiful, but I think this is like a masterpiece. It's it's really just the way he's again the way he sees through things, right? Kind of like seeing through this diagonal, seeing through this file. It's just again, it's these far advanced pawns combined with the weaknesses, combined with the well placed pieces. Just don't forget those those themes, and you can intuitively just you can feel that these things will these things will work out for you, even if you have to sacrifice like d6. You could be in time pressure and just kind of make that move. Although I'm sure he was informed by it. And the computer says it's the best move as well. It agrees with him. But even if it doesn't, I think intuitively it's good enough. And he finds he just finds everything. B7. Again, he could have done this even earlier. But here it's more concrete. And, and after bishop a5, everything collapses. So really, wow. Wow. I'm, I'm, the more I look at it, I'm just I, I'm, I'm really uh, awestruck by this game. It's just it's really a cool game. Uh, by MVL. Uh, again, I like Karawada's game too. Um, but yeah, that's kind of run, almost like run of the mill for Karawada because I've seen so many amazing games by him where he just plays like highly tactically and creatively. Uh, I've seen a lot, I've seen not as many MVL games actually. So this makes me like MVL even better. And one of my students, um, I think he said his, MVL is his favorite player. Um, and, I, and I have to look more into, into him. Yeah. Um, I remember my, my growing up more like, um, my, was it Macron? Um, Bob, I mean, not Macron, Bacro was, was the, uh, was, <laughs> I'm mixing up their names. Bacro was the, was the top French player. And then uh, I'm not sure, I guess he kind of like, isn't as active anymore, or it's, maybe he doesn't get as much attention because he's not like very top, but he's still strong. Um, but yeah, I remember like seeing when I was in high school, um, but now MVL is all, is all the rage, right? All the rave. Um, yeah. So lots, yeah, great. I, I spent a while on that, but there was so much to delve into. That was pretty fun looking at that. And um, you said pawn, and I said in one of the lines you showed where you pin the knight. Can't we capture with rook? You pin the knight. Can't we capture with the rook? If you're still there, let me know uh, what you're talking about. Like which which knight was being pinned? One of the games you pin the knight. I'm not sure. Pin the knight. Let, let me see. So I assume we're talking about the second. Oh, was it? Wait, wait, which night was it? Was it something like? Was it something in the center? Some. Uh, which line is he talking about? This earlier, I assume. If it was. The, can we capture with the? I think it was something in the center he's talking about. I'm not, I'm not sure which line it was where the knight gets pinned. I mean, this is the main pin I was looking at. So it's some like basically, I think he was saying like, or whoever it is, they're saying that that the uh, the pinning piece would be be able to be captured. Maybe I maybe I did an incorrect line. I'm not sure, but let me know if you. Uh... Oh, was it this one? Yeah, yeah. Th this is it. This is it. I think he's talking about this pin right here. He's saying, "Can't you capture with the rook?" Okay. Well, first of all, we take this one. Oh, oh. You're saying take. I think he's saying can we take her. Yeah, you can. But the problem is. Well, that was the beauty of um, Queen F3, is that with Queen F3, um, the thing is you can't take it, right? This is taboo. In other words, we, in chess terms, we'd say this is taboo. The pawn cannot be taken because I think he means this, right? Am I am I right? Rook takes E7, guards this, but yeah, you hold your knight, but you lose this, and that's game. That's easy. Two bishops still have this pin. Well, we could just we could just you know just keep. I mean, he's stuck. Right, he's stuck here. This doesn't offer any any help. You can go c3 or h3. And it's like a zugzwang. But I mean, look, if you really wanted to, like any, if you really wanted to, you can easily win this position too, just by trading down. Um, and again, you don't have to take it anytime you want. But you, even if you take, just to show you, like this is just a clean piece up and a pawn up. And then you just like get your, oh, actually, no, even better. We just go here and we'll just take the pawn. We're up so many pawns and an extra piece. So that's easy enough, too. I mean, everything wins. So I'm pretty sure that's the line we're talking about. Um, and uh, oh, and Car, oh, here he is. He said in Caruana's game, I met where a knight goes to e8 and gets exchanged. 
knight goes to e8 and gets exchanged. Knight goes to e8, and, and that's the actual line that happens. The actual line is the knight going to e8. This was a sideline. He said, Knight goes to e8 and gets exchanged. Can't, he says, um, can anyone think of what it would be? Pin the knight, can't recapture the rook. We should pin the knight, can't recapture the rook. Let me see. I guess my brain is fried by now. <laughs> Probably need to rest soon enough. Uh, but like I said, uh, I said earlier on Twitter about it, about this line, a little cabin fever, right? Starting to feel the cabin fever already. Um, okay. But hey, I mean, just stay healthy, you know, I got to it's just, uh, as long as you stay healthy, but yeah, hopefully it all subsides pretty quickly, <laughs> somewhat quickly. We'll see. Um, yeah, I don't know how it's going to last a little while, unfortunately. Um, but I guess everyone's doing what they can to try to stop the spread. Okay, bishop g4, castles. Okay, so when the knight goes to e8, so was this a sideline? This one? Oh, are you saying instead of, instead of, um, queen d5? Although I don't think we really care. We oh, because he's he's pressuring this, and I think if we put it on the computer. Well, it's saying to it's saying to go after the the rook with queen d two and just keep. Again, that rook is just a liability. Yeah, that's the, that was the problem in those lines. So was that the line you're talking about with ninety eight? This one. He said yes. Side line. You're talking about this one. I saw. I noticed that there's a knight e eight in that line. Uh. Unless there's another knight e8, uh, I don't see another. I don't see another. I think no, it must have been that one, yeah. Got all these trees on the side. It looked a lot. We got into a lot of stuff. Yeah, this is this is great fodder for analysis. Really great lines. Um, so you're talking about right here? Is that the one? You said can't the knight just take the knight? Well, if that's what you're talking about, I don't want to take the knight because I want that rook to be uncomfortable, right? If I if I take the knight, I actually actually let the rook bail out, or or even the queen takes and secures, and you actually give the queen, yeah, you give the queen a space now, securing the securing the rook, and since the knight is gone, it's not covering e6. So if you really want to, you can go back to e6. So it kind of it kind of bails out bails out um, uh, Alexinko Siko whatever Alexinko at, at that position. Um, so is that what you're talking about though? Just to make sure. I think you said yes, sideline. Wait. Um, I assume that's the one then. Okay. So we got first game. Yeah, so that's, that would be the reasoning, I think, um, if it is from this position, it's just, you, you you just you don't want to take it. You just want that knight to be obnoxious. Let it be guarded by this. But the the thing is, it's this temp. It's very temporal, right? It's a temporal thing where where the the, the rook, while he is, so just kind of like floating out there, you want to exploit it, and that's the power of queen d2. Um, oh wait wait wait. I see another ninety eight line. Is that the same move? No, this is a different line, right? Oh, you're talking about this one. That's the other. That's the other time I'm spotting 98. So G5. No, I'm talking about. I mean, there there are several lines here. I was kind of like looking at it and figuring out what made sense combined with computer's analysis. Um, can't the knight take? Oh, because in this line it looks like the rook is bailing out and he's going to win this. So it's like just take the knight and keep this. But see, the thing is, again, if you take the knight. You let the queen take back, and that actually guards f7. We don't want to give them. We don't want to do any favors for our opponent in this sense. That even though it's like we don't really care about the that as much at this point. It's more about the dynamism of the position. 
Um, and I think we want to keep that. We really want to keep the pressure. That's why I suggested in some certain lines this queen d5 idea to hit f7 um, after any kind of knight move. Um, but the nice thing about rook a e1. Oh, oh, and then I missed something where you can take right away, yeah? Yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah. If you have the chance, um, if I did something else and there's ever a chance, just take it, of course, yeah. If Okay, is that what you, is that what you were talking about? Rook, rookie four. So does that make sense now? Okay, so so rookie four says yes. Rookie four, rookie one. Um, where the uh, where where it's hanging? Oh yeah, yeah. So he can't. Yeah, he can't go rook takes d four. Um, I guess I guess it looks like he's gonna go knight takes d six. What if he just takes? Now he's. Uh, Oh wow, we, we, we almost have a, we might get a trapped queen in this line. Because <clears throat> again, we're hitting this. No, no, so he's gonna take, he's gonna take on d6, yeah? Are we gonna get some of these other pin, like similar pin? No, wait, oh, oh, well yeah, no, it's not, it would be a trapped queen, but he's gonna lose the exchange. So we're essentially trapping the queen if he doesn't do anything. Amazing, can't go there, can't go there, can't go there. So, but then, yeah, we finally just give up the exchange. And then the computer is saying King G2, just completely ignore it. Um, yeah, that, you don't need King G2, I, th I think. We just pile up on this, yeah? If anything, yeah, that looks nice, 95. And same, similar idea where it's just really tied down. Let's say the bishop, can we do rook over now? Knight takes F7. What is this line? Is it rook, queen D5 check next? Oh, yeah, that's great. That's a great line. We still get queen d5 check. Uh, king here. Oh, that looks terrible. That looks really terrible. And then his king is really stuck. He has to give the piece back. Takes. And now we're actually, maybe white ends up material ahead after this. Takes, takes. And yeah, yeah, we're still, the queen didn't even have time to take on d5 because then at the end of the line, this is going to be hanging on c7. So okay, then then we cash in with the exchange, and we're just up the exchange in a uh, dominant position. Um, okay, so is that what you're talking about? Was it that line? Rookie one, rook takes takes. Right, with the rook takes c7. Okay, so that's what that's what he's talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, this line, right? Rookie one takes takes, knight takes d takes, and, and yeah, it, it looks kind of like the most practical line for black to go down. But actually, no, they probably should just take on. They probably should just take on d6, and then if the bishop takes, and the bishop takes, and the queen takes, and the rook takes, rook takes. Oh wait, was this the? Oh, this is the line. This was actually the line with the rookie eight, remember? Rookie eight check. And the beautiful thing that I was trying to find earlier, rookie seven, and it's like a Zugzwang, no good moves to stop this. <clears throat> just just left in the pin. But uh, yeah, that's the line where if um, if he does an IT6, which he should do, but if he does, that yeah, doesn't, yeah, obviously, as you said, this doesn't work. I think I might've mentioned it in passing. Oh, you can't do that because of this. Um, but yeah, so so really, if he doesn't take on d6, the only move that makes sense is is taking here. He has to give the exchange back. Um, but again, it's oh wait wait wait, it was it was what was the line? It was taking first, right? Ah, where is it? It was knight takes c7, d takes, rook takes, Not rook takes. Sorry, you said rook takes e1 first, right? Ah, I messed it up. Sorry. Okay, where were we? It, it was pretty good. It looked like it was pretty good, though. All right, where were we? Okay, a bunch of, sorry, it's like a bunch of lines getting mixed up in here. Okay, so we're, we're over here, right? Was it? Where were we? No, it's before this. It's before this, yeah? Did you say the move number?
I'll find it. Yeah, sorry, there's just like a web of moves. I lost it. It was at, no, I think it was like right around here, right? Was it G4? No, it was, it was, I'm pretty sure it was before the sacrifice. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was before the sacrifice. So would it have been here? No. Okay, it's somewhere in this web. Okay, now it, it wasn't this one. It's with the line where the, the rook goes up. There we go. Okay, so this is the line. Rook takes e1. Rook takes, sorry, I lost it in there. Okay, rook takes e1. Yeah, it takes first, then he takes on c7. Rook takes c7. And yeah, the computer saying 95 here. Um, let's just let's just talk about it though. Three, four, five, one, two, three. Okay, I like count the pawns, figure out what the material is. So so okay, whatever. We're down a pawn, but we have still have the dominant position. The main feature though is is well, first of all, we can take this whenever we want. I mean, you could probably just take it and be fine, but we want more of an advantage. So again, the threat is greater than the execution. And by piling up on the knight, we'll probably win the knight or take, again, take the exchange under favorable circumstances. Uh, but if we go 95, I do like to look at that. No, I mean, I can imagine a lot of players would also probably go for like uh, rook d1 and just pile up on the knight. It's probably playable too. But the advantage is maybe, it says like, no, it's like plus three also. The queen moves out of the way though. Uh, it's saying king g2 again, or king f2, uh, because in certain lines it takes, takes, you don't get to take on here because the queen checks and then takes the knight would check, ouch. So you have to play king f2 first, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter because the, the rook still can't guard the knight. So, so the other knight has to move and then it still gives you the exchange and that, again, that should be pretty favorable circumstances there shouldn't be too much um compensation just a pawn doesn't do much but it should be it should be seven it likes a4 to a5 and it, wait then it's saying you should play a5 and your queen i don't know that's weird but any, anyway um i think yeah so rook d1 is playable too but the computer move which i i think makes sense though is just piling up on d7 seems pretty reasonable um, and then again, if the bishop comes out, now that's that's tricky to see though. Knight takes f7 because does I mean does does rook d1 still work though? Just as a practical matter, I mean if it still wins, yeah, it should still be winning. I mean queen moves, but now it wants to take on g6, <laughs> so it doesn't want to win the knight. It I mean you again, I just want to see if you can win the knight. What happens? But then like they get counterplay. I mean, this is still looking good. Queen keeps moving. And then you can take and trade down. And you're up a piece. But again, it's the situation like what happened in the game where he's up a piece. He could have just won a piece and gone into some long end game. But we don't need that. But again, that, well, that's, that's kind of cool, though. There was that. Um, no, there was some line of knight takes g6. What is going on? Knight takes g6. Pawn takes g6. Oh, oh, right, of course, because it's just the discovery. You could toss in queen d5, or yeah, it's just, there's, I thought, I was like, wait, is there some trick with, like, is there something good on the diagonal? I mean, you get the check, but it's more so that it's just, since the queen has, has vacated, she's moved away from the rook, so we just get this discovery on the rook. That's all there is to it. Um, nothing too fancy. But this is cool. The knight takes f7. That's deep. That does get pretty deep. Check. King e8. Again, that's pretty hard to calculate, um, that to guarantee that it works. But look, no, not not necessarily, because rook f1, you're threatening mate on f7. And what if what else does he even have? We're winning the queen now, yeah? We can take the queen and then we can take the rook back if we want to. When you take here, he's gonna have to take back. What if he takes with the bishop, he's losing the knight also. If he takes with the king. And you take this with check, and then you pull it away from this, and then you have, then you take this with check, uh, and then you have a queen for a knight, and you're going to take this, and that's game. So, wow. Okay, does that explain? Uh, it's a tricky line, but, um, but the point is, so once you take, you don't immediately take it back, 
You could, you could, but you don't need to. 95 is really strong. So does that make sense? Cool. All right. Well, hey, that was, uh, yeah, I got a little, diver I, I diverged a little, I, <laughs> I um, digressed a bit, but, you know, we covered, we did cover a lot. So that was pretty fun. Looking at some lines and thank you, Mobile, mobile, mobile Gamers 1 TV. Good thoughts and chess notes. And uh, let me know if you guys have any other questions now that it's going to get processed, if you happen to see it later on. And I will try to keep some more analysis coming. I mean, at least for now, I got a little more time doing more of the, you know, I don't, I usually do, you know, more in-person stuff with chess. I don't like to live on the internet. Um, but yeah, you know, it is what it is for now. So um, yeah, stay healthy, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the games of this tournament.